Welcome to This Is Not About Your Body, where we talk about all the real shit body image issues are actually about because they're never just about the way you look. I am your host, Jesse Neeland, and today I have with me Ekaterina Solaviova. Kate, <laughs> as uh, she is more commonly called, is a psychology college professor turned coach. She has 10 years of experience doing health and fitness type coaching at Precision Nutrition and runs her own coaching business, helping people manage seasonal depression disorder in her cornerstone program called Operation Tigger and also helping other coaches become super coaches. Um, Kate is a mother of two and a devoted world traveler, and she runs absurdly long distances for no reason that I will ever be able to understand. And she's also a fabulous writer. You can find her work um, on Facebook, Instagram, blog posts, et cetera. Also, she self-published a book called Half Pregnant Essays about miscarriage, maternity bras, sharks, and other things dark, hilarious, and universal. And I specifically chose to read that entire title for you because I feel like it tells you a lot of what you need to know about Kate. Uh, she's badass, she's hilarious, and forever curious to explore like the most interesting parts of the human experience. She's also a friend and client. So welcome, Kate. Thank you. I have to say this might be the very first intro that I have not been asked to like pre-provide. This has oh. been completely written in its entirety by you. And this was the very <laughs> first time I got to hear it. So that was yeah. incredible. I love it. Oh, Thank yay. You. You're so welcome. Okay. So uh, Kate, we're going to start with the basics. Just tell me a little bit about what you do and how you came to do it. Yeah, so uh, currently, I would say, uh, I mean, I always wear multiple hats. Uh, right now, I am um, uh, the director of community engagement at Precision Nutrition, which is the world's largest uh, company in online coaching. And I also run a private practice as a life coach for health and wellness professionals uh, and uh, do other things like mothering little humans. Uh, I did appreciate the fact that you put the word devoted in front of world traveler rather than mother. Oh my God, you're right. <laughs> parents are commonly found. So I think that was, that was awesome. So yes. Um, okay. So I guess let's start with the term super coach because that was in your bio or, you know, I found it somewhere as I was writing all this. So give me a definition. What does a super coach mean? And like, what is helping people get there look like? Yeah, I mean, I've been coaching for over 10 years now and uh, pre coaching life. Uh, I was a psychology professor at a college level uh, university, uh, working with folks in their programs on their way to become nurses, police officers, like those were uh, kind of the programs that I was in. And um, when I started coaching, I think I was really just impacted by like what a difference uh, good guidance and rapport and relationship could make on just mm -hmm. like the results that we see uh the the fast forward movement that we see towards our goals uh, and i think over time um i've started noticing some characteristics that i think some coaches had in common so i kind of pulled them out into super coaches and i think of super coaches uh, as coaches that are aligned and regulated and that's um, essentially help coaches become super coaches, where we work on becoming aligned and regulated, aligned to your belief system, to your mm -hmm. values, to your life's mission, to your um, like ultimate curiosity as to what you are interested and passionate about, uh, and regulated uh, in terms of, I guess, responding to stimuli appropriately. Like I always think of this uh, one example, working working with a client and we we're working on food and health and fitness. And she was um, talking about a scenario where somebody uh, offered her a cookie. It was a freshly baked cookie, right? And uh -huh. they reached out with their hand holding this cookie. And she was so dysregulated in that moment, right? Like she, she kind of jumped away uh -huh. and beat the cookie out of their hand right and it was <laughs> and it was such like a like you said you're laughing right? it was such a heartbreaking hilarious of course oh so god relatable and heartbreaking and so just kind of um like perfectly encapsulating of that like craziness that we can find ourselves in and i think like many parents can relate it's that moment of you know you get like a paper cut trying to open the mail on your way out yeah. the door and then you end up just like losing your mind and screaming your head off. And it's it, it's not about the 
paper cut. It's about just yeah. becoming so dysregulated, dysregulated in that moment. So I think when we have the two together aligned and regulated is when you are super coach, but also like super parent, super human, like just yeah. super everything. I And I love the superhero imagery. Uh, so to me, that was just a super fun way. A super fun a way. A super fun way. I love that. So basically just you help people become really good coaches. And I actually, it occurs to me, I didn't write this question down, but for anyone who is not super familiar, do you have a definition for like, what is a life coach? I also have a life coaching certification. So I'm like, I should be able to put this in one sentence, but I'm not even sure I could. Do you have one? Let's just throw this together. I'm sure we could, we could just come up with a definition between the two of us. I mean, when I think of what life coaching is, and I have to say, I, I do struggle with a label a little bit. Like it's, that's the label I would probably pick if I had to yeah. just pick one um, off a shelf. But I think that there is also a lot of um, like negative connotations that we've yeah slap on it right it's like in in some ways we no one can uh buy essential oils anymore <laughs> without it being forever tainted through yeah, like yeah. multi-level marketing companies and yeah. i think it's a little bit of that same thing where i think life coaching is such an incredible profession but i think it it also can just sort of mean other things than what it means i think of life yeah. coaching is um as a as a relationship with somebody who is a neutral third party who can ask really tough questions, right? Yeah. I show up to a situation as a problem solver, not as an expert. And I really right. distinguish between the two, right? Like, so am I showing up to a particular context as an expert? And I spend years uh, being an expert because that's what right. you do in, in front of a classroom, right? Like you, yeah. you're talking at people, sharing your knowledge and expertise. Um, and I still get to wear that hat occasionally, right? Like when I'm interviewed, I'm wearing the expert hat. Yeah. Um, but a coaching relationship and an interaction is very different because I show up as an expert on behavioral change. The client shows up as an expert on themselves always, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I just get to pull out that expertise out of them right yeah. like i don't know what's best for them yeah. i don't know what the best path is and time and time again clients and most of my clients are coaches like they they blow me away by their ideas i would have never been able to come up with the yeah. stuff that they come up with but it is about kind of being able to use like the socratic method and the open-ended questioning in in such a way as to bring that brilliance forward Gosh, I love that. I also feel like when I first was in the program that I got certified through, there was a big conversation about the difference between a coach and a therapist. And it was all like, you know, I, obviously speaking very broadly because broadly because a life coach can be in so many areas, right? Like you can be a business coach, you can be a health and fitness coach. Uh, well, I guess a fitness coach is sort of slightly different, but you know, like there's so many things you can coach. You can be a relationship coach. I'm a body image coach, but like fundamentally life coach is the umbrella that most of them live underneath because it's about helping someone who wants to get somewhere, get there. And therapy is about helping someone understand how they got there. Right. Like it's like the past to the present is a lot of therapy. And obviously there's like the mental you know, illness diagnoses and all these things. And then we are not helping them go from the past to the present. We're helping them go from the present to the future, like helping yeah. them get where they want to go. I think that's a good distinction. And I think that's a good enough distinction for, for kind of many purposes. I think that there are some therapeutic modalities that are very intentionally present focused, right? So I know like years ago- That is I true, yeah. When I was looking for my very first therapist, I was adamant that it it it, it was cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. And because my background is psychology, I have two psych degrees, like I'm kind of familiar with what I was looking for. So I was very specific that I did not want to do the whole past to present and uh -huh. child self. And I did not want to work with my inner child and reparent and rebirth. Sure, therapy. yeah. I couldn't do any of that. I just wasn't ready, able, or willing. And I knew that cognitive behavioral therapy would be uh, really helping me identify the problems in my present and come up with solutions for the 
present. Part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like the same with DBT. I did a DBT group, dialectical behavioral therapy, and I literally like I don't know if you've ever seen the workbook, but I was like, oh look, I do this with clients. I do this with clients. I'm like flipping through, being like, this is literally an assignment I gave this week. Like this is part of a webinar I send to people. Like it's so present focused and sort of a solution, like um, short term. I don't know short term, but it's like the you have a problem right now, here are some tools you can use to like address that. And I found that that was so similar to the kind of coaching that I do that I was really surprised. I was like, oh, there's whole ass therapy is about basically coaching. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I think that there's, and I mean, coaching and therapy, they, they kind of cross each other. Yeah. Uh, like scopes a little bit. And I think it's um, like, I think as long as we're very aware of the scope of practice, which is always like therapists have scope of practice. Yeah. Coaches do not because right. it's not really the profession. Like we uh, life coaches don't really have like that same uh, reg like regulation and regulatory right. bodies as therapists, yeah. um, as uh, therapists do. So I think it just really takes that um, like extra, comfortableness i think with things being more vague and ambiguous and i think like you know that yeah. better than anyone like when does work kind of cross into yeah. the other realm because we often deal with the same topics like because uh -huh. absolutely struggles come up relationships with primary caregivers come up grief yeah comes up. yeah absolutely I really just think of myself like I because I I left uh, the field of psychology very intentionally because um, I think also the path that I was seeing for myself was more in clinical psychology, mm -hmm. um, which would be largely diagnostics and and working with folks with um, psychological disorders and mental yeah, illness. Yeah. Right? And uh, uh, I I have been a recipient of that therapy and I'm incredibly grateful for yeah. all. Of that do that work, but uh, that's not really the work that I wanted to do. So I really yeah. wanted to focus on on folks that, in many ways, who have maybe done that work already or are doing that work, and they want to become more awesome. Like that. That's yeah. really yeah. right. That, that totally. like align, regulate it, and just keep on bouncing or bounce higher. Yeah. So funny because when you said the aligned and regulated thing, I was like, oh, I don't work with coaches like you do. I, I work more with like people struggling with body image, but, uh, aligned and regulated pretty much sums up like a huge amount of the work we do anyway, because so many people are struggling with a feeling of like friction inside them because they're not living an aligned life. And that's a huge part of like, if you want to feel satisfied and not need a million coping mechanisms, you need a life that is sort of aligned with your like inner truth. And that's so hard to do because we have a million messages that say not to do it. So that's huge. And then regulated also, it's just like dealing with whatever needs to be dealt with so that you can move through the world consciously and uh, not not flipping out, not feeling out of control. Like it's it's the same. Well, and I think like, because I've worked with so many coaches, I think if you dig deep enough, we all arrive at the same universal principles, right? Like there is only like so many ways. Yeah. Uh, like uh, I remember somebody would say like, oh, like this, this training program is boring. Right. And I would say, well, there's only so many ways in which a hinge can move. Right. Like, right. It's, right. It's human body. Like we, we, we end up needing to squat. We, we need and uh, needing to like push and press and pull. Right. So there was really only so many things like that. Yeah. If you're going to become more aligned and more regulated, you're going to become a better coach hundred percent, but yeah. you're also going to feel more comfortable in your body. You're also going to be a better parent. You're mm -hmm. also just a better, like less shitty human in general. Yeah. So I think we could literally take this like aligned and regulated framework and we could apply it to like, how to become a better running coach, how to yeah, absolutely. a better engineer, right? Like it, it, yeah. it, it's really just like human universalness. Oh my God. A hundred percent. Okay. So I know that you work a lot with a population that you define as rebels and empaths. So I wanted to hear a little bit about what that means by those terms or, or that demographic and, and also maybe why you're drawn to that population. Yeah. So, I mean, um, while I do work mostly with coaches and when, um, one, one question that coaches often struggle with is like, who do I work with? How do yeah, I yeah. move down? What is my niche? Right. Like how do I decide who to work with? Yeah. Uh, 
one of the biggest pieces of advice that I usually suggest, well, one is don't decide anything until you have like five paying clients. <laughs> right, right. For new coaches. <laughs> because otherwise it just kind of becomes this like rumination. Yeah, absolutely. Masturbation exercise, right? Like that, which just goes like, maybe I should work with. Yeah. Oh, um, I don't know. Martial artists. Maybe I should work with accountants. Maybe I should. Yeah. It just becomes kind of a pointless rumination exercise, right? So, uh, so that's one. But the other one is, I'm going to say like, you know, if you start with yourself, you're going to get a lot of hints as to who you and you will end up working with. Yeah. Uh, and you don't even have to market it as such. Like I have never uh, marketed or led with my like athletic identity as a mm. coach. The fact that like I'm, you know, a competitive trail runner, like I'm a former competitive like obstacle racer. I do extreme yeah. endurance. I have never rolled that into like my coaching practice as a thing, yeah. but I also never needed to because it kind of permeates it. I talk about that sport. Yeah. I talk about my races and competitions. And as a result, when I look at the folks that I work with, that I have a, a former uh, pro golfer, I have a competitive mountain biker, I have you know competitive cyclist in their 60s, and they're all coaches, but they're also competitive athletes. Yeah. And they are attracted to me for that reason. Like it's that like um, identity checkbox that gets. Yeah, yeah. So I think that there's that relatability there. So when I work with any one coach, we kind of talk about the multiple facets of themselves as to who they are. Like I you know I'm a mother of young kids. Like I could absolutely coach young mothers with like- Yeah, yeah. Mothers. Not so young mothers, but like- Sure. Youngish mothers with, uh, with young yeah. kids. Like that could be a population. But again, I, it, it doesn't have to be that way. So I think when it comes to rebels and empaths, it's a little bit of that where like, I'm very much a rebel and a contrarian. Like I am I'm constantly pushing the envelope and pushing it hard. And in fact, like to me, I'm very much the kind of person if somebody says you can do it, I will absolutely do it just out of spite now, right? Mm -hmm. like, um, and then I was the kid growing up, like when told not to touch the stove. <laughs> You're like, I'll figure out for myself what I touch. Thank you very much. That's exactly it, right? They, I mean, it's like, yes, I heard that. I understood the message, but I also needed to make sure, right? Yeah. Like, it's like, yeah, but what about me? Is it hot for me to me? Yeah. Uh, which is so interesting because I, I really feel that way about my work right now right like we can we can take research findings and we can take consensus in literature which is helpful and it can guide our practice and our suggestions but at the end of the day you still don't know how you're going to feel on a mm. carnivore diet or intermittent fasting right. or running long distances until you actually try doing that thing yeah. right so i think i could always relate to that like contrarianness and rebelliousness of like no no like i want to do it for me i also yeah. kind of resent structure mm -hmm. and it's just like push and pull it's a constant push and pull of um feeling like your mind and life is chaos and wanting structure but then yeah. as soon as you have structure you push against it Mm. So that's very much me as a person. And I, I've like had to wrestle with what that means and how to exist, yeah. right? Yeah. Like how to exist as a person who tends to push those edges because it's like, well, you really should brush your teeth twice a day. Says who? I don't want to brush yeah, my yeah, teeth. Yeah. <laughs> it can become like quite dysfunctional yeah. when we are not aligned and dysregulated so totally. it's really kind of like finding um a way to like take that rubble and uh tame them in like the most helpful of the ways yeah. where i can take not that like dominate but like that's right yeah work with work with yeah so um so I, i'm really kind of i seem to attract and a lot of the folks i work with they they can relate to that right they, they can very much relate to like wanting to be told what to do but yeah. then rebelling hard against being told what right. to do 
as soon as they're told what to do. Um, and then I think that the other category also within coaches are uh, helpers and caregivers and empaths. Um, and that's a bit of a different uh, dynamic because those folks are often attracted to the rebellious nature, right? Because totally, like they, yeah. They're kind of in them experience more of like people pleasing tendencies yeah. and they're seeking um, of more of that control. Yeah and being able to assert themselves. Uh, and uh, a lot of empaths actually do have a bit of a rebellious streak as well. So uh, those are just like the two types of folks that tend to emerge when I look at groups yeah. and characteristics. Do you know, okay, so two things came out of that, that that occurred to me as you were talking. The first one is like, I will, I often work with empaths, um, you know, people who are highly sensitive, people who are people pleasers. And I do think there is that draw because I'm more like you, I am more rebellious and, you know, very independent, stubborn, all the things. Right. And I think one of the most common things I do with those clients is I invite them and encourage them to call upon their inner rebel. Like instead of, someone, you know, says something mean about the way you look and you just kind of go like, oh yeah, like I should change that. You go like, I'm sorry, fuck you. Like that is such <laughs> a rude thing to say. Like, because some part of you knows, right. You can really get to the place where you're like, why is it okay for them to say things like that? It's not. And I wouldn't normally say anything. I want to be polite and avoid conflict, but like there is some part of me who's pissed. And so inviting people to tap into that rebel side of them is so helpful, especially when someone is all the way on the other side of the spectrum. Yeah, and I think what becomes much more challenging, and again, this is so uh, present in your work, I know that, it's when all of those monologues and comments are inside our own head, right? Because it, it, it's, it feels like it's much easier to externalize and visualize the quote unquote problem. Like when somebody uh, outside of you in the store or on yeah. the street says a thing, right? Yeah. Because it's like, oh, it's this person who's an asshole, right? Like who's making comments that are completely uncalled for. But a lot of times like, the work that I often do with clients is actually disentangling those voices in their own head, mm -hmm. because sometimes the mean voice comes from within and they actually think it's them, right? Like there's right. this notion of like self-loathing, like yeah. where I suck and I'm a failure and I'm horrible. And I kind of go, whoa, 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 like, I'm sorry. All these things you just said about yourself, I know you well enough to know that this doesn't sound like you, first of all. Wow, right? yeah. And if you were to go to a whole bunch of your friends and people who know you well and ask them to describe you, would they describe you? Yeah, as of course. Those things, right? So, and they're like, oh my gosh, no, absolutely. It's like, so who, who the hell is this voice, yeah. right? How often I get like hysterical laughter as a result, because as soon as I ask that question, there is like a person. Yeah. That, oh yeah. I've had the same. They're like, Oh, it's my dad. <laughs> like, Oh, <laughs> mystery solved. <laughs> yeah. So, and actually this is also how I think about coaching because we all have this choir. We have a choir of voices in our head. Yeah. And for all of our sakes, I hope that there is a balance of like kind voices and mean voices and critical voices and supportive voices. And hopefully we have this entire, you know, team, this entire mm -hmm. choir of voices. Sometimes it's really just like, I don't think the goal is to remove the, the mean voice altogether. Like, like we kind of talk about the inner critic and the inner rebel yeah. and the inner bitch, like they can all be super helpful, right? Like yeah. when, when used appropriately, like think of that feisty, super assertive friend, my God, you want her by your right. side in certain situations, right? Like, um, but I think it's like to, to actually work with a coach is a way to literally implant an additional voice into that choir. Ooh, I love that. What well, a wonderful way of putting it. As a coach, you hear this. I yeah. Know people will be like, oh my God, I had you in my head all week. And like, I was able to make these different choices. Yeah. A hundred percent. Exactly. It. Like I just heard you ask me that question. Oh, like what's in it for you. Right. Or like, yeah. 
Come on, get pissed or something, right? Like something. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a question that you've asked. It's maybe like an observation that you have made, and it's literally like that's what we do. Like if if I'm overwhelmed with my choir of negativity and self loathing, it. The, the idea is not that I'm somehow going to read a book and love myself tomorrow, right. but rather I'm going to start distinguishing the voices, like which ones are real, which ones are imagined, which ones are my mom, which ones yeah. are, right? like, are my dad or my coworkers, that boy who commented yeah, on my yeah. very arms when I was nine, right? Like yeah. all the things, which one of those voices is actually me? Yeah. like intrinsically really quintessentially me and very often it's like so deep down like we have yeah. to like find that person and then when you kind of take stock and you're like goodness like there's not there's not a whole lot of kindness on this team yeah. this is where we can bring the third party yeah. right because you bring a coach in who you have rapport with and who you respect, and they are going to be that positive voice because every single one of my coaches has been that voice. Yeah. For Where sometimes right. you go and say, I just need you to tell me today that I don't suck. Yeah. Right. And it's like, you don't suck. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. <laughs> um, so the other thing that I, I had come up as you were talking about, uh, like the rebel and sort of who you are is that I think having had that experience as someone who needs to learn everything for themselves, try everything from them for themselves, think through everything for themselves. Like I feel that it, that would automatically make you a better coach because you are coming into it already honoring, like as a default value, their autonomy, their agency, and their experience, which I know is something that like different coaching pro uh, programs and everything, they'll teach you how to do, but it's like, you get it in your bones. Cause you know, that if someone were to give you the best advice in the world, it wouldn't matter until you did some trial and error and figured it out for yourself. Right. So tell me about the role of like, for you as a coach in your practice, how do you support someone or help them reach their goals or whatever it is while also honoring their autonomy, honoring their agency, um, like, how do you handle accountability when the whole thing is based on like, this is about you learning for yourself rather than me telling you what to do? Yeah, I think that there's, it's, it's kind of a line to, it's a balance to strike because on one hand, sometimes we can create an impression that like, well, it's completely client driven, right? Like, oh, the client just does whatever they want and whenever they want. So it's like, what do you want to talk about? We'll talk yeah. about whatever, right? It's like, and then there is actually zero structure. And instead it's like, no, no, you want accountability. Great. Like let's figure out what the, what the accountability looks like. Mm -hmm. So in some coaching circles, we'll say like, well, no, like I, I will always be positive. I will never provide you with any sort of like even constructive criticism. Mm. I will never, like, I'm not the coach who's going to give you a kick in the butt. Meanwhile, I say, I'll, I'm happy to give you a kick in the butt. I'll make sure it's consensual. Yeah. <laughs> let's establish consent and yes. as long as what you're asking is sort of like within my system of values i'm more than happy to do that like it, it yeah. has to work that way right like so i will get your permission first yeah. uh, and in order for that to happen we need to have rapport there mm -hmm. needs to trust established and then we can kind of talk about well what will accountability look like for you and yeah. i've had clients who would say kate i don't understand like i really need to like make myself do this and it could be like a thing an important thing it could be sure, yeah i don't know some application they need to submit or like it, they really need to sign up for this competition they've been dreaming of for months like, mm -hmm. like i just can't bring myself to do this like is there anything you can do to just give me that kick yeah yeah say okay well here's one thing i can do you and i are supposed to have a coaching call in two weeks do you want me to create a consequence for you and sometimes they say yes and sometimes they say no but i can say well how about this i can actually do um i can create a consequence where either you register for this thing by the night before we're scheduled to talk and if you don't i'll cancel our appointment and I'll charge you anyway. Oh my gosh. I love that. Like, I don't have an issue doing that, right? Like, yeah. Or consent. Are you up for right. it or not? Right. 
yes, I'm up for it. I need that. Yeah. I, I but need it would also like as brilliant as that is with consent, it would be such a unethical dick move exactly. without it. Absolutely. Oh my God. It would be such a manipulative. Yeah. Thing yeah. To do, right. Just, but just like, you know, any, any sort of kick in the butt would be sure. right? uh -huh. coming up to a stranger and just giving him a kick in the butt. That's assault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So right. yes, context matters a lot. Context yeah. is key. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Okay. So you have like such a ridiculous amount of experience coaching people across so many different like topics and demographics. Um, and I am curious what you would say is like, what's the thing most coaches are getting wrong or like the biggest misunderstanding coaches have around like how to help people reach their goals or whatever? Like, what do you think the the issues that you see anyway among coaches tend to be oh where do i start jesse <laughs> um no i mean there is definitely some um there is definitely some threads and some themes that come up right and those threads and themes are completely and utterly understandable and relatable right and and those are the things that i've done and have experienced done yeah. myself like all the things that we do quote unquote wrong and then when we yeah. know better, we do better um and i sort of think of like when i work with coaches uh this is the making coaches into super coaches yeah. Like where we can sh short circuit, <laughs> like we can we can fasten that that evolution yeah. if that makes sense. We can sort of skip over some of the parts. Um. So the big one is many folks come into coaching because of a transformation of their own, right? So they they discover yeah. a thing. Like maybe they struggle with a health issue, or maybe they just struggle with like lifestyle uh, not yeah. being find right like where they're burnt out and busy and they're not moving and all of a sudden they find a thing and that thing could be a coach that yeah. that or it could be a coaching program or it could be a sport or maybe yeah. they have children and that has this uh like paradigm yeah. shift impact on them and they discover the power of the power of movement, intentional movement, the power of like good nutrition on how they feel, the power of sleep. I can literally probably pinpoint a person for every single one of those. Like there's yeah, a yeah. discovered importance of sleep and now they're asleep. Yeah. Meditation, spirituality, essential oils. Exactly. You could do one for everyone. Yeah. Yes. So, and they now teach meditation, sell essential yeah, yeah. oils. So it, it's because it, it truly has changed their life. Mm -hmm. So, and because of that, I think uh, many coaches as they're starting out are coming into it with that savior complex uh kind of vibe right where it's like yeah. let me save your life like yeah. you have no idea how much <laughs> this right yeah. like you have no idea how, like do you know how much sugar is in that yeah and, do you know this can cause diabetes yeah. and i think like that is coming from such a good place right like it, it is truly coming from like I felt bad and now I feel good and you feel bad and I care for you and I love yeah. you and I don't want you to feel bad, but that's just not how humans work. Like right. nowhere in the history of humankind, like somebody heard somebody say, you should do this. And they said, you know what? You're right. I should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I think like that's, that's often, um, that's often a thing that is just frustrating for all parties involved yeah. because it is so like unsolicited non-consensual advice giving yeah exactly it can be so frustrating for the coach because they're thinking like oh my god why wouldn't you listen like, yeah, like I, I have, have the answers see. yeah the answer right and then for the other uh person and that's kind of the reminder i often give is like you remember that you're the one who changed they haven't right like mm -hmm. so uh, they have this like newly discovered zealous thing being yeah. potentially pushed upon them. So that's probably one. And then the other theme that I noticed quite a bit, and that's probably true uh, both with starting coaches, but also experienced coaches as well, is where, uh, where empaths struggle especially, is where we care so much that we become over invested in clients outcomes. Mm -hmm. 
And that is a tough place to be because then like you are more invested in the client's uh, you know, like gaining weight or recomposition in their body yeah. or after, right? Like, or uh, running a marathon than they yeah. themselves are. And that actually creates a lot of frustration for the coach. Like mm -hmm. my client is not doing the thing, right? Like they're, they're not losing the weight or whatever they're doing. Yeah, right? yeah. So, um, and it can also create a lot of pressure for the client. Yeah. Because, and like guilt and shame and like oh feelings. Goodness. Yeah terrible and this is coaches would sometimes say like i don't understand like i'm a nutrition coach so you know i've asked my client to do a food log and they're like lying on their food log and it's like well why could they why would they be lying like yeah. what does that tell you right so that can actually create that sense of pressure from a client of like not wanting to disappoint you not wanting to do like they want to do everything right but they're struggling yeah. Right. So I think like that just really becomes the self-perpetuating, very harmful dynamic. And I kind of get to see a little bit of the behind the curtain in the yeah. coach's mentality because they really struggle. They feel like they're a shitty coach mm. because their clients are not getting results. And it's like, yeah. but like that that's a broken causal link. It doesn't work yeah. like that. You being an amazing coach doesn't lead to your client's results mm. you being an amazing coach leads to your clients feeling supported and empowered mm -hmm. to do what they want to do yeah yeah yeah, yeah sometimes yeah. that is losing weight and sometimes that is not losing weight and yeah deciding that that's not at all what they want to do and that right. is success right so mm -hmm. like, so i really think of like my work like what is success is increased clarity yeah right it's that and and also like just intentional and conscious decision making like it's it's like deciding what it is i want to do yeah. so like whether we talk about food or nutrition or like alcohol comes up a lot like yeah. redefining like people's relationship with with food with alcohol mm -hmm. with a substance maybe it's sugar or cigarettes or whatever it yeah be. and i also think that i'm um, this is actually you and I talked about that quite a bit because I feel like your work has played a big like a big uh, impact on how I coach is that notion of neutrality. I think it's I'm not I'm invested in you doing this thing or that thing yeah. and that makes me this neutral party by definition uh -huh. like, i'm not gonna freak out just because you tell me that you use cocaine recreationally you want to cut back yeah totally okay right it's like you I'm never going to tell you you have to quit yeah. it. I'm not going to freak out. I'm not going to get surprised, right? Like I can But think about how many coaches would. Like I think that's such a huge thing. It, it sort of blends the last two things you've been saying, which is like when your ego is on the line or you like define your own self-worth by your client's success, like you're going to uh respond inappropriately to certain things like that's just what's going to happen and then also if you're coming and being like i had a major transformation like i went vegan and then the person like eats meat you're like horrified right like but but you know and i feel like in order to avoid both of those pitfalls you have to be a neutral party but it's really difficult for people to do because as you said those are those are two really understandable places to come from as a coach um, and it's funny you say like you learned this from me because I learned the term from you. I've never heard anyone else say change in action neutrality as a coach, but I love it so much. So I want to have you just like define that. Like, tell me what that means to be a change in action neutral coach. Yeah, so I think I, I first used that expression in, in a client interaction a few years ago where they were talking about like they were acknowledging a feeling of pressure which was incredibly self-aware of them. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, like little little pat on the shoulder whenever like folks are expressing those, like, okay, I'm doing yeah. something right because we have that rapport where they feel comfortable yeah. acknowledging that, right? But they were talking about that like rebellious, like uh, inner toddler throwing a tantrum, right? They're, yeah. they're saying like, you and I have been talking about like moving more and uh, eating higher quality foods 
these are the things this person wanted to work on. Yeah. And just by talking about them, I feel myself wanting to throw a tantrum. Like I feel the pressure, like even though I know you haven't even told me to do it. Yeah, anything. yeah. And I know you won't, but I still feel myself wanting to like rebel and push against. Yeah. Um, and that's where it was the kind of like my way of trying to reassure them. I said, I want to, I want to remind you, and I will remind you again and again that I in our work together, I will be change neutral. I oh. will be action neutral. So I, I, so will, much. I will show up and I will ask you questions yeah. and I will support you and I will be there. Um, but I am truly uninvested in whether you choose to take that action or not. We can talk about vegetables till the cows come home yeah. and we can decide that vegetables are the best thing that has ever existed. And you can go and not eat a single vegetable for the rest of your life. Yeah. And that is totally and utterly fine with me. And I will not be upset. I will not be disappointed, nor yeah. will I, I will be, not judge them. I will not judge them, yeah. nor will I be thrilled somehow and overly ce ce celebratory if you choose to eat a cucumber. Like, yeah, it's yeah, fine, right? Like you can eat a cucumber or not. And I mm. think as because such a big um like focus and emphasis on, of my work is autonomy i sort of think of like as yes. grown ass adults it is such an amazing place to be because no matter what choice you have in front of you you always have two choices you can either do it or not and <laughs> both are okay right and yeah and both will come with their own sets of consequences sure and they're price to pay. And that's incredible because yeah. as long as you can choose that thing intentionally and consciously, you just made a conscious decision. Yeah. You're going to drink two bottles of wine by yourself. Have you done that consciously and intentionally? Amazing. Right. Yeah. Is your head going to hurt the next day? Absolutely. You, <laughs> right. You know that. Yes, you did. Right. And this is no different than folks with, you know, dairy allergy, choosing to yes. have or somebody who's gluten intolerant wanting to try some of that homemade like known as yeah. because it's worth it it's an intentional decision so I yeah. kind of say like and uh, I think a big part of where like the change neutral and action neutralists come from is that I will not like you any better if mm -hmm. you eat vegetables yeah or not right like so i but that's the unconditional like in order to be a neutral party it has to be an unconditional relationship and i think that's what's so tricky when you're so deeply invested as you said a lot of coaches are you really can't be unconditional you're like i have one condition and it's you do what i did because it was really good and i think you should <laughs> like yes. you literally have to find your way to an unconditional relationship in order to be change neutral and also like that is the kind of relationship that nourishes and supports people and actually encourages change anyway. Well, and I think that is all to say, like, um, I mean, I have one, I have many uh, rules that are helpful. One rule that I have for myself. I loved your rule email, by the way, that I just yeah. read. It was so good. Uh, the one rule that I have for myself as a coach, I only work with awesome people. <laughs> work with you you are fucking incredible already yeah, yeah right so what does it matter if you eat cucumbers or not i don't care right yeah. like you're not gonna make you're not gonna become any more awesome by eating eggplant or moving your body more and yeah. i think that's how, what kind of allows me to be action neutral and change yeah. neutral where it's like no no i i get you i like you like we're in it. What I want to do, I want to make sure that you're supported and you're moving in the direction that you want to move. Yeah. And if that direction is cucumbers, all the power to you, right? Like yeah. the power is yours. I'm not invested in cucumbers. They're all yeah. yours to, to choose. So I think like it, it's really like I'm kind of going back to you know the the psycho like the psychology classics with like the unconditional positive regard right like with the um, uh the paradoxical theory of change right like we're saying like it, in that change occurs when we become who we are 
rather than trying to become who we're not, which is this like counterintuitive clusterfuck, right? But yeah, like, yeah. you see that all the time. It's actually yeah. in that moment when you like stop looking, yeah. when you find, when you stop, like stop trying to become is when you change. Yeah. And it's not that I don't have very human opinions sure. and very human judgments. I'm very wary when people say, I don't judge. It's like, are you dead? Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> right? like, of course we, we judge, but I think there is a huge difference between um, not judging and not bringing it into your work, mm -hmm. right? Like where, yeah, I, uh, I really struggle to be neutral when I watch yeah. my four-year-old refuse to eat vegetables. Sure. Right? And I will serve vegetables to her and I will try and keep a straight face about mm -hmm. how them yet again right yeah. so and that's kind of an example of where like do i have an opinion in my head yeah do i kind of wish she ate the freaking vegetables <laughs> yes but <laughs> also i have to act within my system of beliefs and yeah. that is her autonomy to eat or not eat and then i'm expose her to this yeah thing. oh my god it's so simple and obvious when you put it that way, but also so like radical, like that's such a huge deal because most parents certainly don't do that. Right. Most parents are like, just eat the vegetables. Now it's a rule. Do it or you're going to your room or whatever. Right. Like it's so hard to live in that space. And but I, yeah, go the ahead. One thing I, I want to try and really take away, right. Like, because I think in some ways, um, we can't help but have a certain power dynamic in a coaching role, right? Like there mm -hmm. is still like the coach client relationship, but what I never want to set up is this like dynamic of you do this thing for me. Yes. Right. Like, Cause that totally just, strips them of autonomy, even if they do it. Oh my gosh. Of yeah. course. And this is like why I very rarely say like, Oh, I'm so proud of you because it's like, who, who the hell am I to be proud of you? Right. Like, so, mm. and I think if, if the client, if the person truly feels like that neutrality yeah. and yet unconditional support, yes. then it's actually up to them. Like yeah. the, if they choose to do a thing, they do that thing for themselves. Yeah. And that's the part I will celebrate. Yeah. Forever, right. Like it's not that you ate a thing or you moved right. your body. It's the fact that you did that thing for you. Mm hmm. By the way, I feel like you'll like this. I just learned I had a friend say, I'm so proud for you on Instagram. And I was like, oh, my God, I love that. And she was like, oh, yeah, like I stopped saying I'm proud of you because it strikes me as patronizing. And like, who am I to be proud of you? Like, I'm not your, you know, like I'm not your parents, but I am proud. And so proud for you is like a little I was like, oh, my God, that's great. I'm going to start using that. Oh, that, I like that. That's tiny change makes a difference. Yeah. So. I want to acknowledge here because I feel very similar to you. I work very similarly to you. Unconditional positive regard. I love everybody I work with. It makes it easy to see them as valid and whole and worthy, whether or not they make these changes. Um, but also it's kind of blasphemous in the space of coaching to say that you're change neutral when kind of like the main deal with coaching is like you help people make changes, right? So I'm curious how you like hold that or talk about that or think about that, that this is both within your value system and I think like research would back up that this is a more effective way of helping people make changes that actually benefit them. But it is sort of the opposite of co uh, common wisdom around coaching. Like we have this idea of like, hold them accountable, like change at any cost, you know, like what do you do with that? I love it, Jesse. <laughs> Counterculture, contrarian, blasphemous right reverent. I like all of those things <laughs> it's the perfect place to be that is fair and goes back to the rebel but you something I actually really like about this conversation is it's really showing like you and I both identify as rebels we can see big places in our life where this has shown up a lot of people don't have that but even the people who don't have that do have an inner rebel and they are maybe railing against their idea of what they think people want them to do, even if it's not explicit. Sometimes it's totally explicit. It's like, this is literally what people want me to do. And I know it because they tell me. Sometimes it's just, I feel like people want me to lose weight or want me to, you know, 
go further with my career or whatever it might be, get a relationship. And then, and then a lot of times it's just themselves holding it against themselves. Like they're not change neutral for themselves. And so they feel bad all the time about not making the changes they told themselves they should make. So that is in a lot of ways, their inner rebellion, like, because it didn't come from an aligned place. It didn't come from a regulated place. It didn't come from a place that actually felt like certainly not unconditional positive regard. You know, it's like, I either do this or I'm bad. And then you don't do it because that's just not how change is made. It doesn't work. But that is, I'd say, most people's inner monologues around change is not change neutral. Well, I think like somebody used the the analogy of bamboo, right? Like if you like become bamboo and be like bamboo rather than a rod of steel, right? Uh, where bamboo bends, <laughs> but it okay. doesn't, it, it's like, it's the embrace, like, or like, it's flexibility and like the more fluid and flexible you are, the more adaptable you are, the more resilient yeah. you are. I'm so passionate about just being a well-rounded human that is hard to kill, right? Yeah. Like, so, and I think that I think of it as helping people develop their full range. Like we talk about like vocal range, like being able to use your totally. entire range. So what is it like to use yeah. your entire range of everything, of, of movement, of health, of love, of pleasure, of work? Like, because we do tend to just thrash around between the extremes. And we see that yeah. in the field too. Like you kind of, like there is a lot of pressure to pick a camp, like which I, I, <laughs> I saw a new massage therapist a few weeks ago, and she learned that I was in the health and wellness industry. And without irony, she asked me, so what camp are you in? And I just burst out laughing, right? Oh, because my gosh. That's exactly the point. I'm not yeah. in the camp. Who do you I play for? <laughs> who do you play for? Like, I refuse to join one because... Yeah. For me, joining a camp and kind of like signing on a dotted line somehow implies like now these are all like these are the only tools that are available to me. And I'm like, yeah, fuck that. I want to use all the tools that exist. Like, why would mm -hmm. I want to join the whatever, like the macro counting camp and criticize the in intermittent fasting? Why would I only be a runner and criticize CrossFit? Right. Why not everything? Like, why yeah. can't I have all the things and i think that's also part of like the rebel is like i don't want to pick yeah I want to have everything i want to have all the things and i think like to actually allow people to even function within that flexibility can be so liberating because how many like people i've worked with that are very creative and they want to write but they can't do the freaking morning pages practice yeah yeah right? And they've tried and they failed and they just feel like a failure, right? Yeah. Or uh, runners who feel um, like complete and utter like shitty runners because they can only run while training for a race. And as soon as the race is over, they stop running because there's no goal. Yeah, yeah. So with all of those examples, the underlying assumption is that your experience and motivation should be linear. And they Ooh, are, yeah, 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 they are, right. But for many others, they're not. So yeah. I think the issue is that what we often see portrayed and elevated as success is a very linear thing. Like yeah, every yeah. Sunday, I meal prep, and then I have these plastic containers for the whole, yeah. week, and that's what meal prep looks like. Yeah. Right? Or you know, I run three times a week, and here's my training log, and that's what success looks like. Yeah. I write morning pages every single day, like whatever it is, like posting yeah. on social media, uh, writing newsletter every single week. So I think just exploring the idea is like, well, what if you could lean into that? What if you're the kind of runner who needs a race to train for? So just have a race. Like what's, what's the problem that we're solving? Uh, the number of people who feel so bad about themselves because they need a personal trainer to motivate yeah. them. And I say, but you, you just, you're working with your own tendency. You yeah. have identified the fact that you do best with external accountability. And then you hired that yeah. support high five. Can we celebrate yeah. that? But I want to be the kind of person who yes, yes. Well, oh God. I want to be that all the time. 
who likes classical music and I just don't, right? Yeah. Like I could either force myself to listen to classical music and be generally miserable yeah. or not. So what I hear in this that is just so like delicious to me is yes, we are focused on like the coaching relationship and how you are a neutral party and change neutral and all these things. But ultimately what you're talking about is that you yourself have gotten to a point of essentially just like a neutral lens as you move through the world. There are no good and bad. There's only interesting and sometimes appropriate and sometimes not appropriate. That is a revolution. Most people, because of what we're taught, is they're always going to be like, this is good, this is bad. Like carbs, sugar, fruit, literally everything has a moral label on it. And my work is all about re removing the moral judgments and labels of good and bad when it comes to the body and everything having to do with it, both the, the behaviors that you take, you know, actions, and also how you look. But like that applies to literally everything. And you are applying it to everything, which means that when you go into a coaching session with a client, they're maybe for the first time given permission for everything to be on the table without moral punishment if they choose wrong. And that just instant relief, right? Like that's instant calm for someone who has been living under the like must choose right or else I'm bad, you know, or whatever it is. There's so much peace and and joy and love in that neutrality, which is something I always think is kind of funny. Cause even though it's like neutral, you'd think you don't feel anything, but I'm like, Oh, you do, you know, like <laughs> actually adopting a neutral lens really, really ushers in joy and goodness. Um, but the, the way you're approaching it, it's like everything neutrality. Yeah. And I think it's, it's kind of like, it's the feeling of hitting your head against the wall and then giving yourself permission to stop, right? Like instead of just not wanting the wall to be there. But mm. I just don't want, it's like, yes, it would be nice if the wall wasn't there. You could also right. stop putting your head against it. Yeah, right? it's like an acceptance, like an acknowledgement first and an yes. acceptance of what is the situation? The wall is here. What is mm -hmm. in my control? Oh, I see. Like that is so much simpler. So it comes up like with, like with empaths and caregivers and folks that are people pleasers. Like I don't want to be a people pleaser. Uh -huh. and it's like, well, that may or may not be a realistic goal to yeah, change yeah your personality based on my core beliefs yeah. way back when but we can talk about you know like coming up with with tools coming up with words coming up with like building different stories and also i think of like elevating your own opinion above others i think that's yes, where, how yes, i think about yes. it it's like well if you care about what other people think of you you probably are always going to care about what other people think of you but yeah. you can actually care about what you think more and i yeah. think that's where it it becomes really important yeah, so yeah. how can we like acknowledge what is and then start functioning to the best of our like ability like what is thriving and flourishing looks like yeah. in that without changing my very structure yeah skeleton uh, of character so i feel like in, in what I do with clients, it's a lot of basically taking failure off the table. And I would say that this sort of neutral lens, um, that we share in that space and sort of everywhere, it allows for a lot more playfulness because I mean, this is a very weird thing to say, but I, I know you're going to understand is like, sometimes the worst experiences that a client goes through, we can just like giggle about it because we're being so honest, you know, they'll be like, I, I had my assignment. I went up to my husband. I was going to tell him exactly how I feel. And then he said something. And instead I cried and told him I wanted to watch TV. And I don't know why I did that. And I, I spent the entire rest of the night, like literally analyzing, like, why did I do that? Why didn't I say the thing? Right? Like we can laugh about it because we're being so honest about what's going on and we're allowing neutrality in all of it. Like it makes sense that that happened. We can talk about how to make that not happen maybe, but like it's all okay. You can't fail. If you don't do an assignment or an assignment goes horribly, that's great. That gives us information about what we want to talk about next and where, you know, like where we want to take the conversation around what the block is or what, you know, all these things. It's, it brings such joy and playfulness to the sometimes very heavy and painful growth and evolution process, self-awareness building, all those things. And it makes it, I don't exactly want to say fun, but I think you know what I mean? Like, yeah joyful. 
Well, and I think it's kind of figuring out the full faceted, like the multifaceted nature of all the experiences because everything has a flip side. Like that's, you know, of course I, I go out and I write a funny book about having a miscarriage because that was <laughs> such an act of re like rebellion for me because yeah. so I've experienced a miscarriage with my first pregnancy a number of years ago. And I remember like kind of looking like there's that again, universal human experience and looking for stories, yeah. and shared stories. And all I could find were two things. It was these very clinical, like I did this and this and the description mm -hmm symptoms right and then there was just these very sad hard breaking wrenching stories right like with angels and what could have been oh, wow. uh, and neither was really reflecting what i was experiencing because to me it was heartbreaking and heart-wrenching and disappointing and sense of failure and all those things yeah. but at the same time i found it fucking hilarious how <laughs> it was just so ridiculous right and like, for the record anybody listening it it's written it i giggled out loud as i read it it is truly horrifying success. heartbreaking and hilarious somehow all at once success right and i think that to me is like the truth of like being human where yeah. it just never stops being all of the things yeah like, at the same time like it is constantly amazing and horrible and hilarious and amazing yeah heartbreaking and and it's like that's i think the cool part about it because yeah. we are so laser focused in anything being like just one thing all the time and how many times like that becomes like the end of us where i mm. lose my identity because now all i am is a mother right or i mm. lose the sight of everything because all i am is a body and it's mm -hmm. like oh like let's just like blow it open and let's consider what else is there like let's go back yeah. to the full range what else oh. what else is happening what else are you experiencing what else are you what else can you do i love that so before we wrap up you did touch on this a little bit but i wanted to hear you talk a little bit about conscious decision making like this is something that i know we share the the power of watching a client go from unconscious decision making to conscious decision making uh you you say you're like you don't celebrate or be proud of them or whatever uh for the actions, but I do feel like something I celebrate, like sometimes even internally, even if it doesn't come across, I like air whoop when I'm listening to a Voxer message or something and I can hear conscious decision-making. It makes me so happy to be like, you, you pulled this thing that was a, like a knee jerk reaction on automatic and leading you in a direction that didn't feel right. And you did it consciously, even if the action is literally exactly the same, the experience of it is 100% different. Um, and this can apply to like, skipping a workout, binging, um, yeah. you know, not standing up for yourself or, or setting boundaries, like all of the things that a person might think, oh, it's better to do the thing, but from a place of change neutrality, you, you don't have the like success and failure metric anymore. So talk a little bit about what you mean by conscious decision-making, like what that looks like and also why it's so powerful. Well, because I think from that lens, we don't actually have to change the behavior. Uh, sometimes the behavior changes, but it doesn't have to. Like the behavior can look exactly the same way from the outside, but what happens between the two ears is completely different, right? Uh -huh. And I mean, a lot of it is kind of similar to like if you, if you think of body image work, where the same same person, right, like can look in the mirror six months apart, and their physical body might not have changed, but they see something completely. Yeah different right yeah. so and i think it's really it's really that it's coming to to peace it's that sense of like the quiet and mm. the yes and the, the quiet and the clarity right like yes. and it doesn't, it truly doesn't matter what the behavior is when somebody can say like oh well goodness like i don't know i spent fifteen thousand dollars last year on shoes okay like on purpose yeah. or like right is this a coping strategy to cope with something else yeah or or we have had a conversation and we have actually identified your values and fashion and fun um is a really huge part of it and then you looked at your budget and you said you know what i'm going to be spending 20 percent of what i make on shoes yeah 
amazing. Send me pictures, yeah. right? Like, because it just be, yeah. gives you all the permission to now enjoy it. It's the difference yes. between standing by the fridge, eating out of a carton of that ice cream and sitting on the couch and enjoying the damn thing. It's the same ice cream. It's yep. going to the same, yep. right? But it doesn't feel the same. And I right. think one, I think really makes you feel more like that, you know, I, going to say self-actualized human that you are right it's like it makes you aligned and regulated we're going right back to the first conversation like literally yeah. the experience of making a decision consciously even if it's the same decision that you normally make and feel a lot of shame about and a lot of guilt about you're doing it now from a place of alignment and regulation yeah i'm gonna eat everything in my kitchen I'm not gonna <laughs> feel bad about it i'm gonna do it like and i'm gonna Maybe not even enjoy it because that's not available for me if I'm in like a, you know, a bingy space, like, but I am going to give myself permission before I do it. Mm -hmm. And now I can't feel shame about it, right? Like, because you didn't have a moral hierarchy of this is good and this is bad. And I feel like an example with body image stuff is always like the difference between you wear a full face of makeup or you get a boob job or whatever from a place of I'm unworthy, I need to earn my worth. I need to do all these changes so that I can be, you know, seen a certain way, whatever. And doing those things, uh, either because you enjoy it or it feels good to you, or even because you recognize that this is going to earn you a certain amount of social privilege that you are willing to put in the effort and the time and the money to get like, both of those are conscious ways of doing the same thing. And sometimes people will be like, Oh, is it like bad or like not body neutral if I do such and such? And I'm like, Oh, there are no like body neutral decisions. It is entirely the intention and the permission. And I think that's where I kind of go back to that, like, well, what if the full range of experiences and feelings and tools was available to us? Because I think like what we often see, right? It's that, like I said, the thrashing like yeah. we go from strict dieting and restriction uh, and macro camp. Uh, and anti like and fat phobia, the whole full on diet culture. Yeah. We go all the way to intuitive eating only, right? And anti-diet yeah. and it's, it's a very different camp. And yeah. while it's like, well, what are all the places yeah. in between? Like, so are there intentional conscious ways of changing your body if you so choose? Because it, I don't know, makes running easier, for example. Mm -hmm. I'm all for it. Like I'm all for that intentional decision making i mean yeah. i'm an ultra runner and that's not a sustainable anything like yeah, you, yeah. Go, you run for 15 hours right? right so somebody says it's not sustainable or moderate of course it's not right yeah by definition right yeah. and and that should be available to you and to me so i think it just comes back to i want you to have options i want you to have all of them and mm -hmm. i want you to be able to pick and choose right like which ones I love it. Uh, what do you hope people take away from this episode? Oh, goodness. What about the, um, well, I think change neutrality and action neutrality is kind of a new term that yeah. we just. I, I love it. I hope it stuff. takes off. Um, <laughs> Okay. Tell everyone where they can find you. If they want to learn more, if they want to follow you, if they want to work with you, where can they find you? Uh, I think the best place to find me and get in touch is probably at my website, which is my last name.com. So look up my name uh, and it's going to pop right up. I'm not going to bother spelling it. <laughs> it's okay. It'll be in the show notes. <laughs> there you go. Um, anywhere else that you want to send people? Or uh, and, uh, probably Instagram account where I, I'm uh, very active lately, just with coaching tips uh, and uh, hashtag Operation Super Coach insights, uh, client stories, and strategies, all that. Excellent. Um, everyone, I highly recommend going and following Kate. Um, I personally love all the Super Coach tips, I enjoy them very much. I think that they're uh, funny as always, they're like challenging, they're smart, they're useful, but they're also funny. I, I feel like every time I see something and I slide through and I'm like giggling, imagining you saying it to someone, um, because it really does. I think, I think this entire conversation has been a reflection of the way that you coach and, and the way that you make content is like challenging people to, to hold it all and to be neutral and be curious and bring a playful energy 
to the dark places and just see what's there, which is, I just love. So thank you so much for being here, Kate. Anything else you want to say for today? That is it. I've loved our conversation. I love all of Amazing. All right, everyone, you can find me at my website, jessenealand.com. You can find me at Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter, TikTok, everything at Jesse Nealand. And uh, that is it for this week. And I'll catch you next week. Bye.